Welcome back, everybody. Um, I'm really, really uh, excited to be able to moderate this uh, opening panel, the dawn of the age of learning, new realities for ed tech. Um, we have the three of the most uh, important, influential leaders you know, in the space, uh, all doing incredible things. We've got Dan Rosenzweig, the CEO, chairman, and president of, of Chegg, $15 billion uh, market value business, nearly $15 billion, 6.6 .6 million subscribers. We have Baiju Ravi Dharan, and um, everybody just, he's like Madonna, just goes, you know, everybody knows him by Baiju. Again, a, a, an amazing business with uh, uh, $12 billion market value, 5 million paid, over 5 million paid subscribers. And then we have Louis Van Aan, the founder and CEO of Duolingo. The language market, 1.25 million subscribers um, you know, on the Duolingo platform. And so welcome, welcome guys. I'm so excited to, to have the opportunity to, to interview you today. Um, so let's just kick things off. So the three of you have created three of the most valuable, fastest growing, most transformative ed tech businesses in the world. And you're all B2C uh, monetizing with subscriptions. What's been the key drivers to, you know, why, what have been the key drivers to the success that you've had? And maybe I'm gonna give it to Dan first because you've gone through quite an evolution from the time you came over to Chegg uh, just over 10 years ago. Well, thank you, Mike. And it's great to be on a panel with these other two illustrious gentlemen. Uh, and I, I admire what they've done and envy a lot of it uh, for reasons that I think will become clear as you get to know them better. I, you know, the way we think about it is pretty simple. The education system, like all other institutions, whether it be government or whether it be the press, um, every institution at some point gets to the point where it's built to defend itself. And it oftentimes builds barriers so that its customers have no choice but to use it, and they become very unsatisfied, and so they can continue to raise prices. So in the education industry, almost everybody felt that their customer was the school, the administration, or the professor. And they forgot that the person paying the bills was the student. And when you think about who cares the most, it's going to be the student. So when we looked at the landscape and we said, you got the administration, professors, students, parents, and uh, uh, companies. The two that had the motivation to change the fastest were the student themselves and the companies. So if everything was designed to tax the student on behalf of the school, we said, we can't do that. Then we started to get a whole host of emails um, when we built the textbook rental business from thousands and thousands of students who thanked us for allowing them for the first time to be able to afford textbooks. And it was moving. And I one day put at the bottom of my email signature, we put students first. And that became the mantra for the entire company. So everything we do is we say, we don't work for the school. We don't work for the professor. We don't work for the administration. We work for the person who is trying to invest and better themselves, who's willing to put in the time and the energy to learn something, to improve the likelihood of their success and their career. And ever since we have done that, our North Star has been clear and our business has accelerated dramatically. So we chose direct to the consumer, not because it was direct to the consumer, we chose to serve the needs of the student because they were clear, they were obvious, and everybody else was taking advantage of them. And we wanted to help them. And that's how Chegg uh, built itself. So, Baiju, talk, talk, talk about what you think is the, the keys to your the growth and success have been. So, from the beginning, continuing with where Dan left off, having the student-centric approach, and also knowing that for online learning to work, and something which is not so intuitive about online learning is the fact that it has to be made in such a way that it's appealing for students to learn on their own. So, online learning is actually self-learning. And for self-learning to work, it's very important to create formats which are uh, like, uh, like which will resonate with students, whether it's movie-like videos, game-like interactions. So finding the right balance between keeping it engaging without losing its effectiveness. My favorite phrase for that is putting the right amount of chocolate coating before we take them through the broccoli it has been the key. <laughs> so, uh, and, and, and that too. Uh, and so keeping it student-centric while creating the product as well as 
while devising a go-to-market strategy, considering the fact that we started in a country which is obsessed with spoon feeding, we've been able to create a segment of self-learners or read that as online learners. The early days and long way to go before I'll call it a success, but a promising start. This is awesome, Luis. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's pretty similar thing. I mean, for us, we I, I think I think the reason for our success is our mission. I mean, we're a very mission driven company. Um, you know, early on, so I'm I'm from Guatemala, which is a very very poor country, and and a lot of people talk about education as something that brings equality to different social classes, but I always saw it as the opposite, as something that brings inequality. Because what happens in practice is that people um, who who have a lot of money can buy themselves the best education in the world, and therefore continuing to have a lot of money, whereas people who don't have very much money barely learn how to read and write, um, and therefore can never make money. So our mission has been really a driving force for everything we do. Um, this is why you know, uh, you know all the courses that we teach, you can fully learn on Duolingo entirely for free. Uh, and when our users love the product and it's free, they tell their friends. Uh, so pretty much all of our users' growth has been through word of mouth. Um, uh, and another thing has been very similar to what Baiju said. I mean, we, we've had a huge focus on keeping learning, uh, learners engaged. Um, we, we realized early on that the hardest thing about learning a language or learning anything by yourself is, is staying motivated. I really believe that. That's the hardest thing uh, about learning something by yourself. So we've worked a ton to make our, our product uh, as sticky as possible. Um, and, and at the same time, also, we've worked on making it more efficacious. Um, so I think the combination of free, fun, and effective, that's kind of the, the words we use, free, fun, and effective, um, have, really, have really made us grow a lot. Yeah, the three of you have all utilized uh, in some form or fashion of the kind of free offering to get people's interest and engagement and then monetize through subscription. What do you think, the, I mean, what do you think is critical and, and why do you think both, all three of you have been able to create such successful subscription models? I mean, what's sort of the, what's sort of the key elements uh, of that? And I think both, uh, all of you, you know, have got extremely impressive Kind of engagement and 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 customer student satisfaction. So, I, I, if you, I'll start, Mike. Um, what we said was, if you look at what Netflix did, what Netflix did was say, get what you want. We're going to give you stuff you may not know that you want, but you might need. But the key is, we're going to give you overwhelming value for your money. So even when Amazon launched Prime. Neither Spotify or Netflix were hurt by that. And the reason is because even if there's one thing that you wanted to watch on Netflix, it was worth the $11 a month because it was overwhelming value. Check took the same approach. We said, we're going to provide overwhelming value. We're going to continue to invest in the product, in the content, in the quality, in the user experience as both of these gentlemen articulated. So you can learn through step-by-step -step solutions. You can learn by expert Q&A. You can learn by live tutoring. You can learn by video because anybody who has more than one child knows no two children learn the same way. So we focused on the premise of surprise and delight and overwhelming value. So in 10 years, in 11 years, I've been CEO of Chegg. We've never raised the prices and yet our margins have increased and we've invested more. We started with 400 pieces of content. Now we've got 54 million pieces of, of content. And that we've done in 11 years. And so for us, we utilize technology to increase access, lower the cost, improve the experience. We use data science. And all of that is designed to say that if you just use Chegg Study once and it serves your purpose, it was worth 10 times the price. And, um, and so we just keep making it better. So that is why it's worked in our opinion, because the internet breaks down in two buckets, two large buckets. I'm busy or I'm bored. Chegg is I'm busy and I'm in trouble. Whereas Instagram is I'm bored. Duolingo might be both. Right? Doesn't mean doesn't mean one is better than the other. It just means in our case, they only come to us if they have a problem. We better damn well solve it. And we better do it quickly and we better do it in the way that they need it, or our value proposition doesn't sustain itself. And so I think that's why we've been successful is never losing sight of solving that one problem with overwhelming value. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember, Dan, when you were in my office and your market cap was a fraction of where it is today, and you said that exact thing that you just said now about how your focus is going to be delivering overwhelming value for that subscription, and you just kept on doing it and doing it, and the, the results speak for itself. 
How, how about others? I mean, what sort of, you, what do you view as a, a sort of the key to the success you've had in terms of converting and monetizing the, the, the subscription models? So ha having this premium model, premium subscription model is critical, especially because it's kind of a new segment which we have created. When we launched our learning app way back in 2015, where apps, uh, well, there's nothing for learning. So we had to kind of define and create a new segment. Uh, students were not learning online, students were not willing, parents were not willing to spend for that. So creating an experience which helps them to discover the offering as well as uh, like also understand the benefit of learning this way, where learning when they, uh, whenever they want, wherever they want, how many hour times they want. With that kind of flexibility to a large extent, what we have replaced is offline after school tutoring, which is, uh, which can be very expensive because there is a teacher involved. So having this productized approach helps us to keep price points which are significantly lower than tutoring. Uh, obviously, it's it's still higher than a textbook, but uh, for most of the students uh, in the uh, kids' learning segment, uh, it, it's at a fraction of the cost. So a, a freemium model is critical because otherwise we wouldn't have been able to create this new segment of uh, self-learners. And I'm like considering the fact that it's, it's still, uh, we, we live in a country where learning is driven by fear of exams and not love for learning. Uh, we've been able to uh, get this uh, like engagement right, which is a leading indicator, but uh, eventually what really matters is how many of the students stay. We have, and we have enjoyed more than 80% retention on our annual subscription now uh, for the last five renewal cycles, clearly showing that we have found that balance right. Yeah, that's, that's very impressive. Luis, how about you? Yeah. I mean, I, I would echo what Bai just said. I mean, for us, freemium has been uh, really important. You know, for us, um, freemium, what it does for us is it gives us huge scale. Um, only 4% of our users are paying subscribers. So 96% of our users are just, just users for free. But we, we value them a lot um, for a couple of reasons. One, they serve as our marketing engine. Um, uh, you know, basically, they, they tell their friends. Another reason is we get, to, uh, we get a ton of data from them that allows us to improve how well we teach. So for example, uh, we have, we have so, you know, if for example, if we start charging everybody, we know that in the short term, we would make more money if we charge everybody tomorrow. Um, but uh, two things would happen. First of all, we would stop growing as fast, which I really don't want to do. And secondly, uh, we just wouldn't have as much data and this data we can use, we use in really interesting ways. So for example, um, whenever we, whenever we don't know what the best order of teaching something is, we just have enough data that we can actually do A-B tests to figure out how to best teach. So if we want to know whether we should teach plurals before adjectives you know, to, to Portuguese learners, for example, um, and we may not know the answer to that, we just do an A-B test for the next 50,000 people that sign up. To half of them, we teach them plurals before adjectives. To the other half, we teach them adjectives before plurals. And then we measure which ones learn better, which ones stick around for long, longer, et cetera. And so that is the type of thing that you can only do if you have just a humongous user base. And, and I just don't think we can have uh, as large of our user base if we didn't have a freemium based uh, base model. So that's that, that to us, I think, has been a, a key, key to success. So Mike, yeah, so if, if, Mike yeah. if I could just sort of jump in on that, something that I think people are, are missing that these guys are hitting on and hopefully Teg is hitting on as well, which is the three of us exist because the existing systems fail. If they worked and they were doing what they were supposed to do, we wouldn't be here. Wait, what, Dan, you did not get to perfect proficiency in German while in high school? <laughs> uh, no, um, I got to proficiency in Yiddish at my grandmother's house, but that's a whole discussion. Um, We're about so, to launch Yiddish, by the way. We're about to launch Yiddish. I'm going to be your first customer, my friend. So, um, so think about it this way, which is education needs to scale. Classrooms can't really scale. Every learner is unique. So there isn't really a resource in which a, a teacher, no matter how great they are, and there's so many great teachers, can actually take the data points that Luis just talked about and put them together in a way that they can instantly turn it around for that or any other student and then scale it. But with technology, you can. And so the big benefit of being a, a direct to student, direct to customer business, if you own the customer and you own the data, and you own the channel of distribution and you own the content, you should only be able to improve the experience on a per person basis instantly, which means your moat gets bigger, your growth gets better, your engagement increases, 
and your renewals, as Baiji pointed out, go up. All three of our businesses are benefiting something that no school could ever do, no individual professor that could, could ever do. And this is why going direct, having that data, utilizing it is the advantage that companies that become platform companies at scale, that's why the biggest companies are growing faster than they ever did before. It's never happened in our history. This is the reason. If we know every single thing that a person, by the person, by the school, by the subject, by the time of day, by the professor is struggling with the classroom, we can program on behalf of that person what they learn best and what they need most. And nobody, no school can do that. I, yeah, I think that, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say there's, there's even more to that. I mean, I, I've always um, been very thankful. This was a little bit by happenstance, but I've always been very thankful that we decided to teach something that in, in our case is not uh, necessarily as regulated as much in schools and also that a lot of people want to learn outside of school. So language is one of the few things that people want to learn both in school and outside of school. Right. What that has allowed us to do is own the curriculum. See, if we had to align to the way in which languages get taught in Texas versus the way in which languages get taught in New York versus the way they get taught in Mexico, we would be in this mess where we own the curriculum and that also allows us to basically find the best curriculum because we just have much more data than basically anybody else had in the past. So that, so what we're starting to see now is that schools are aligning the, curric the curriculum to us um, because we've just reached that scale. But that is, you know, that is something that was just not possible in the offline world. So, so Luis, you and Dan both came into the education digital learning market from being both wildly successful in the in the broader tech world. Do you think that having the the experience that you know, that's both of you, the I mean, I guess what have you having that experience that wasn't you know wasn't thirty years in education? Um, you know, you basically took that experience to be able to apply well, he's it. Even thirty years old, so I don't think that's fair. <laughs> But, but talk about how having a, a kind of being an outsider coming into this actually has been to an advantage. Because I think in both cases, um, it, it really has. You know, in in our case, I think it's you know it it was an advantage. It was it's a double edged sword. I would say you know early on we started coming. So I was a computer science professor, and my co founder was also a PhD in computer science. We knew nothing about how to teach languages, and so we kind of figured out on our we read a bunch of books about how to best teach languages. And then the, the, the outsider piece came into, you know, came into being when we realized that we could figure out what was the best way to teach languages using our own data. That really helped. Um, and so that, that, is, that, that basically was the, the, the biggest thing that, that really we, we, we thought of this as kind of like a, a, through a computational lens. Um, and so that helped a lot. Now I will say, um, early on, we didn't have anybody in the company that knew how to, how to best teach languages. By now we've hired you know, dozens of people with PhDs in second language acquisition. And that has actually also helped a lot. So, so, you know, by now we've reached the scale that, it, that really we use both. Um, but it, it's an, uh, you know, the other thing that I'll say, it's an interesting thing. Whenever we hire somebody in, uh, you know, with a PhD in second language acquisition, um, they need to kind of be untrained for about six months. It's this interesting thing where they come and they know a lot of stuff, but almost everything they know was discovered in a classroom, you know, in uh, where, where the students are, are kind of held hostage because they can't leave. And so, you know, when they come, we tell, you know, they say, oh, there's better ways of doing this. And we tell them, yeah, we know that there's better ways of doing this in the classroom. Unfortunately, it doesn't work when, you know, in, in an app setting. So, so it's, it's this interesting thing where um, uh, I, I think a lot of the, the particularly scientific findings about how to best teach just need to be redone with or refound uh, with, with an app. Dan? Yeah, look, I, I don't know because I didn't come from that background, but I do know that if you're going to be in education, you better have a passion for it because it's not easy and it matters. So this is one of the things that, that I, I knew going in because my mom was a public school teacher for 39 years and uh, my brother never went on to college and he's been very successful in his own right, which he's a janitor in a school. And here I am in the education industry. Um, and, and I had daughters, Mike, who you know, and, and went to school with your daughters, uh, who were going into the college situation. And when I realized that every, nothing had changed since I had gone to college, you were using the same Barron's book, there was nothing online, there were no really good online tools, nothing was making it easier, you still had to pay to apply to the school. Uh, college guidance counselors to student, the ratio is 1,000 to one in the state of California, which is effectively zero. 
that all the experience I had at Yahoo and ZDNet, CNET, Guitar Hero, I felt like for the first time in my life, I can apply what I knew as a business to something I cared deeply about. Yeah. yeah. And, and then, as you know, Mike, because you're in it, you run the largest conference in the world on education. Once you're in it, you can't get out because you're obsessed with helping these young people. Yeah. So, Baiju, you had, you're, both your parents were teachers. So how has that influenced you in terms of what you've uh, you know, doing with, with, with your company? So they never taught me any subject, to be very honest. They, uh, uh, early on, they taught me the importance of learning how to learn. So like, to, and combined with the fact that, and I'm not telling this to dramatize the story, I come from a small village, south of India, went to a government school with all its challenges. Forget about finding good teachers, finding teachers itself was a challenge, which forced me to become a self-learner. Now, how that's important is because self-learning means what? You teach yourself first. And I used to teach myself first, and then I used to teach kids in the village. So from the time I remember, even when I was in eighth grade, I used to teach kids in 10th grade, 11th grade, at least the subjects which I thought I was, which I was passionate about, math and science, and continued with that. So uh, like ended up becoming, so this love for math, learning math and teaching math ended up creating something big. So I started with a, like 30, 35 of my friends who came to me for help. By sixth session, it was 1200 students. And at its peak of when I was doing it in offline, there used to be like, 25,000 students learning simultaneously in large stadiums. So uh, that way, uh, like influenced, uh, like in, in, in its right sense. So this conviction on self-learning is actually from within. So I normally say that I just summarize it by telling that an engineer by chance, but a teacher by choice, which made me an entrepreneur by chance. So being an accidental entrepreneur uh, helps you to think very long-term and that thinking long-term is critical for education because you can't have short-term results. And that's why a lot of tech companies fail because you cannot show outcomes in one or two or three years, right? So uh, for me, it's been like many years of teaching offline in, in very unconventional ways, which forced me to innovate uh, because uh, when you teach 25,000 students, you also need to start assuming, like you can't do it like a classroom as what, uh, as, as what Louis was mentioning. So- No, Mike, I'm sorry, Gabiji, as you finish. Yeah, so, no, like, so like for me, it was moving from, a, from those giant screens in stadiums to personal screens, uh, like somewhere along the line, and in a way positively disrupted our offline business by moving online. So a lot of influence in terms of uh, uh, like uh, becoming a self learner, or like which is nothing but teaching myself first. Right. So that way influence, but uh, which created uh, something which hopefully will uh, uh, last decades. So, so Mike, what I was going to say. Is as you know, and, and I'm old enough to have met all the great entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley, and I'm meeting Baju really for just for the second time. But I've met Luis and just blown away by him. The best companies aren't founded necessarily by people who come from that industry or not. They're people who have a problem that they wanted to solve, and it turned out that problem was for a lot more people than just them. And then yeah. you realize that you just can't stop. And I think, so it doesn't really matter what your background is. It matters um, what you just heard the stories of what these guys are doing. Luis told me the story that basically uh, the other professors at his school didn't like him because he was teaching in a different way and much better and, and nonstop. And they were like, you're making us look bad. And, um, and but when you run a, a product direct to the student at scale, you're going to be working all the time, making it better every second of the day. So it's perfect for him. You know, why don't I bring up, I mean, you guys, you're all three so wildly successful and just really disruptive in, in, a, in a marketplace um, that, you know, where, where change historically hasn't happened as fast as you've made change happen. And so, you know, you had, there's some critics. I mean, the, you know, all three of you have critics that say, you know, Dan, you guys, you, you know, say here to help people cheat. And Luis, you know, are you really, you know, and, and I mean, what, what do you what do you say? Did you spend any time thinking about that? Kind of because I think it's you know obviously, you know, it gets stupid, and unfair, and it's, but it's, it's what kind of critics say. Um, but what, how how do you address that? And and what do you what do you do to kind of change that narrative, if there if there is any of that? Luis, you want to go first? Sure. I, I, I'm okay. So you know we. We don't focus a lot on on our critics. Um, I, I, so you know, the one of the criticisms that people give us is like, well, Duolingo kind of looks like a game. Uh, how can you learn a lot from from something that looks like a game? Um, you know, what people may not know is there's actually a lot of sophistication in the background. Whenever you start a lesson on Duolingo, you know, we have a huge we have a student model that is 
personalizes the lessons for everybody. Um, so we know we know everything that you've done on Duolingo, every exercise that you've done, everything you got right, you, everything you got wrong. We know why you got it wrong. And then we give you lessons that are kind of tailored to you. Um, and so, you know, we have the largest group of people at Duolingo are trying to improve how well you, we teach. Um, and, you know, something like 80% of our employees are working on engineering or product related stuff. So, so we're always trying to just teach better. Um, and uh, so we know, you know, we have the data that shows that, that, that we teach well. And, you know, the way we try to counteract it is by um, just being, being honest with everything. And so we, for example, we just put out a, a research study that shows that um, if you get to a certain point in the Duolingo course, um, you learn the equivalent of four semesters of, of university education, um, and it's in half the time. Um, so, so by doing stuff like that and, and, and admitting, for example, that, that it's not perfect. I mean, you know, you do still have to put in all this time. Uh, we're not as good. We're, we're as good for reading and listening, but not as good for speaking. Um, and just admitting, admitting that and, and admitting that over time, we're just going to get better and better. I think that's, uh, that's, that's our, that's our stance, I think generally. Yeah. Yeah. In, in, in our case, look. Um, these two guys are founders. They can do something that I can't do. So I inherited the company and I'm a refounder. So it matters to me as much as it matters to them. And our view is the empire always tries to strike back. When I was in magazine publishing, I was told that the internet would go away and, uh, and that magazines would crush it. And so we know how that happens. You know, radio said TV wouldn't matter. TV said cable wouldn't matter. All those guys said streaming wouldn't matter. So the empire is always going to strike back and they're going to try to protect what exists. But when you look at what exists, 43% of all students in the United States that go on to higher education don't get a degree. Of those that do, they, they graduate, if they graduate, on average, it's six years, not four years. They leave with tremendous debt. Even if they don't graduate, they graduate with $9,000 in debt on average but $35,000 in debt if they do graduate. And then they're going into jobs where the average salary is $25,000, where they have 44 million Americans have $1.6 trillion in debt. So our view is the system that exists doesn't work. The issue around us is it's almost whimsical for me, which is imagine a scenario in the age of the internet and cell phones where you've given tests that were generated. Your professors don't even write their own tests. They generate them from these publishers who've written their curriculum. Then they, they use these old questions and they give it to people who are in a pandemic at home and they don't think they're going to use the internet. Like, that's just stunning to me. It's, it's, did you not notice there was an internet? So that has nothing to do with Chegg. On the flip side of that, we take this stuff really seriously. So we double the number of people to pull down content that perhaps should not be there. Second thing is we, we use data science and technology to be able to make sure you couldn't upload more than one question at a time. Even if you did it through an image, you couldn't do it. The next thing we did is we built something called Honor Shield, which lets every professor preload the test and the time the test is going to be segregated on another server and says, we'll block those questions from being asked during the time of your test. The issue isn't us or the internet or the students. It's if you give old, if, if you don't invest in technology, if you don't invest in online teaching and online learning, and you don't reimagine what the curriculum needs to be, and you don't reimagine the way you need to assess students on a model that was failing anyway, then there's no reason for people to go to you or to pay you. That's the bigger challenge. And that's what we're hoping to work with institutions and professors on, which is where are your students struggling and how can you help them? Because we have the data. And they don't. So, you know, look, we, we deal with it because everybody has to deal with it. But I don't know a single successful company. Remember, they told Tesla nobody would drive an electric car. So yeah. no, they told Brian Chesky of Airbnb nobody would rent somebody else's room or a house. They told Jen Hyman to rent the runway. Nobody would rent the dress. I'm OK being in the in, in the conversation where people criticize what we're doing what, right now, because that means that we're making an impact. Yeah, no, I remember people said that you you you, you bought you could uh, short test the stock and all the money you're going to make shorting the stock, you could buy a car. I don't think that worked so well. Yeah, not at all. Not on Tesla. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, you.
I, I'm not sure about we don't waste a lot of time answering all critics, but it's it's uh, if, if you ask me, it's important to listen to them uh, because that's where you maybe identify the gaps which you missed out and will helps you improve. But the fact is uh, the way we like uh, the way we have created these segments because as I mentioned, it's there's no playbook for success here. So most of the mistakes we we ourselves identify early on because that's the only way you, you make mistakes, you learn and you move on, and that's how can you like make make multiple small small mistakes, and when you figure out a way to scale. Go big at it. That's been the approach, but but still, it's important to like uh, l- listen to like fair critics. Uh, though like t- t- in this world, uh, uh, like some of the detractor messages get amplified so much that you can't ignore. But it's 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 tough to answer all critics. Important to listen to them. We listen yeah. to every student. We listen. We can watch what they do, how they use this, whether they like it, and and just like you with the you know with Duolingo with the research, ninety percent of all students that use Chegg report. That they mastered the subject better, which is what we care about, because that's who our customer is. Yeah. So obviously, the pandemic has accelerated the digital learning space and all your businesses in a, in a material way. Do you think this is a permanent catalyst to 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 to, to, to see the kind of now, is it going to be a permanent step up, or we're going to re, is there going to be a revision to the mean, or how do you think about the future uh, growth for 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 your company and the digital learning space overall? Well, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll give it to, give it to Luis first. I, I know that you've got a bunch of the data too. You've seen, and you're all global, so you, you have you have different data in different markets. So I think it, it, it's it's interesting what that tells you. I, I, I think it's a fundamental change. Um, uh, you know, for a couple of reasons. I mean, a, a lot of people I think discovered um, that they could. Uh, you know, there's a couple of things. A lot of schools discovered that they could do a lot, rely a lot more on Duolingo. And I, th- you know, you've, you've seen them, a lot of them have gone back, but they stayed using Duolingo. Um, so that's, that's a big thing. Uh, another thing for us, at least in particular, um, we have, you know, most people know us for the Duolingo app. We have this, our, our second largest product is this thing called the Duolingo English test, which is a, a high stakes assessment. Uh, it's basically, it's, 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 it's an English proficiency test that you can take, uh, you know, for example, to uh, get into a university here in the US if, if you come from, a, from another country. Um, and the idea is it's competing with like the TOEFL if you, or the IELTS. And our test is online, whereas these other tests were all you had to go to physical testing centers. What happened during the pandemic is that these physical testing centers closed and we had our own online test. And then all these universities, um, because the, the, the other tests were not being offered, came to us. And so by now we're now accepted by like 3000 universities. Um, and, and this is permanent. You know, they're going to accept us forever. And so our number of tests that people have, to, basically our test has now become a real contender um, and, and, you know, to be the, the official way to, you know, to speak about your English proficiency. And I think that's a permanent test uh, change. Yeah. Yeah. And think- this, uh, like just, to, uh, just to add on to that. So what we have seen is uh, uh, eventually it took a uh, crisis like this for all, almost all stakeholders to try out online learning, whether it's uh, uh, more and more students are, have seen the benefit of doing it this way in the last few months. Teachers have started using digital tools and in the early days where like in, in uh, countries like India where some of the teachers were even struggling to create PPTs. Today you will see a lot of them using like many more digital tools. Uh, institutions are trying to go online. So though a lot of schooling will go back to maybe 100% offline, I, ideally it should not be like it should be something in the middle where we uh, like the ideal format will be a blended model where we bring the best of online and offline because there are things which can which can be done better online and there are a few things which can only be done offline. So uh, possibly our classrooms will change for the first time in 100 years. That's the hope. Though learning at home, the our segment, which, which is purely based on learning at home, will move more and more online. And uh, that's uh, that's where this change, what we have seen, is, is going to be like uh, uh, more permanent and it's going to become mainstream. And, and uh, look, our belief is Chegg was built from day one to, to bet on the inevitable. The inevitable is more people are going to have to learn more things over the course of their life. They're going to be more dependent on themselves. They're going to be more self-learners. Um, therefore, it has to be on demand, has to be affordable, has to be personalized, and it has to have an ROI at the end. It has to be something where the person feels like because they did it, something got better for them. So it's that can only be done at scale online. It doesn't mean it's going to be exclusively online. 
And in the United States, I think you break out K through 12 as being very different than higher ed. K through 12, they're going to go back into the classroom because that the system, the free educational system is designed to do that. Um, but I hope, like Baiji's talking about, that after school learning can be done by the schools through people in the home, as long as they have access to technology, which we also ought to fix. The second thing is in higher education, there is no doubt, if you look at the research that we produced, that 75% of all students, whether they had done online learning before, done it for the first time, um, they concluded that they want hybrid situations. Because you know what? 40% of all students are working 30 hours a week or more in the United States. The average age of a student is 25 years old. So you're talking about people who have children, who have jobs, and they can't afford just just taking one class at a community college is a half a day out of their ability to earn an income for no particular upside or benefit or anybody who's had a kid blocked out of a class before why should we ever block a class on freshman year you should be able to take it online and off time they're doing it based on the physical size of the plan so it's inevitable it's here to stay and even professors have now grudgingly acknowledged as much as they hated it uh, that 50% of them on a survey already said that they think they can teach as well online as offline. Now, that, again, that's higher education, not K through 12, which I think is a very different dynamic. And I'm just going to let you know, we've got just a little bit more than five minutes, and I've got a number of things I want to talk to you guys about. So um, if we, we're going to hopefully shorten our, our answers just a little bit because there's a, you know, a bunch of things I want to ask you. First, first question, artificial intelligence. You guys are all... Obviously, artificial intelligence is a, is, a, is a key part of what you're already doing. What kind of role do you see that playing in improving learning in the future? You know, what can be done, I guess, is a better way to say it, with, with artificial intelligence, and how is that going to improve the learning experience? We, we, Lisa, I'll let you go first because you're the, you're, 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 you're the Carnegie Mellon expert. <laughs> uh, well, okay, so a couple of things to say about AI. First of all, when anybody says that they do AI for education, I am extremely dubious. Uh, I, I, it's, it's mostly used by companies to boost up their valuations, is what I think. Um, that said, I do think there's, there, there's some to it. I, and you know, the way I see it for teaching some, some, somebody something, what you got to do is you first, whenever they come to your platform, the first thing you got to do is figure out what they know. Then you got to adapt to what they know and start kind of from the frontier to, to, to increase it. And then you got to keep them engaged. These are kind of the things you got to do if you're teaching somebody. Uh, and I think AI can help in all of those. I mean, for one, you know, really trying to assess when somebody comes in and we do use it for that to try to assess what they know, uh, to, to adapt what they're, what they're learning and also to keep you engaged by giving you things, you know, give, giving you things that are going to keep you as engaged as possible. So for example, with Duolingo, every time we give you an exercise, we know you have about an 80% chance of getting it right. That is good for keeping you engaged. Mm -hmm. Stop. Thank you. Yeah. So. Uh, and that's the key, like just to what we have identified in the last couple of years is that giving students uh, assessments where the chance of getting it right is between 70 to 80 percentage. If you make it too easy, then you will see drop offs. If you make it too difficult, then you will see drop off. So AI obviously helps us to identify what students does and does not know, uh, helps us to personalize uh, the, the study path or the, the learning journey. Uh, Though, uh, and apart from this, it, it also it can also help us something which we don't do today. It can help us in creating content and content creation, what type of content, which format works well. So personalization at all levels, though what we do very well today is personalizing based on the, the size of learning and pace of learning. Uh, personalization on proficiency level is easy. What I think will, in, will be possible in future is how do you personalize based on the, the style of learning? Like all of us learn in very different ways. Some of us learn better by seeing it. Some of them us learn better by playing. Some of us learn better by doing it. So this learn by seeing, learn by playing, learn by doing. If we can identify which format for which subject works best for an individual student. And that's the scope of for the future. Today, personalization on proficiency level is actually easy. That's what most of us do well. But there's a long way to go before uh, uh, technology can make its real intervention in the way in, in, in personalization. Apart from obviously content creation, some part of tutoring can be done now through AI, but I, I don't think it will replace teachers for, for many, many more years because teachers have a role to play. In fact, the golden age of teachers is going to come back because today anybody can go online and start teaching, but augmenting teachers with uh, by like rather than depending on the judgment of the teacher to personalize, we can support by giving them, uh, helping uh, them identify the level of the student. In our case, I think we, we think of it for, cre uh, for creation and presentation. 
more than teaching itself, which is how should it be presented and what should come next? And that has been very effective for us. So, Deanne and Baiju, you both have made a number of acquisitions. What lessons have you learned about companies that you brought into the platform? Um, what, 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 what's key to making that successful? I'll, Dan, I'll go first. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, something which has been important for us when we actually scout for acquisition is uh, how complementary it is. Is it complementary from a platform perspective? Uh, uh, is it bringing the new format? So if you take a look at any of our significant acquisitions, either they are, they are either for uh, technology platforms or for, we are very strong on the asynchronous format. We have acquired recently a company for uh, which added a strong synchronous format. So that a blend of asynchronous and synchronous is what really works for students and uh, varies across markets. Uh, now to make it work, generally people say that acquisitions are designed to fail. It's, it's very important. So I don't use the word takeover. It's, it's important to integrate people and platform integration is easy, but once one thing which we have, where we have, where we over index is making sure that people are, feel comfortable. We don't try changing the culture because what defines if you are trying to change the culture uh, by acquiring them and by really taking over, it's only a thin line between support and control. So we make sure that we don't cross the border of we give a lot of outside support, minimal inside interference, and that's how we've been able to make these uh, like two of the significant uh, acquisitions. I strongly feel we have already made it work. Uh, again, doesn't guarantee that the next one will also work. You can't be com complacent, but important to integrate people. We have not lost, forget about co-founders, even the anyone in the top management, we have not lost in like, say, like any of these acquisitions, which is uh, uh, which is based on, like it's, it's not by chance. Yeah. Look, I, I, I agree. You have to have a reason to do it. You have to have, you have to be able to accelerate its growth and reduce its costs, um, or it's not additive or accretive. But essentially, when you build a platform, you want to leverage your brand, your reach, your data, all the technology that you have that, that these earlier companies perhaps have not had a chance to build that can accelerate their rate of growth and let the brilliance of what they do grow faster. Um, I, I believe that we need to have one set of values, but we can have multiple cultures. So the values are, do you believe in the student? Do you want to put the student first? Do you want to support the other employees in the company? Do you want to win as a team? And do you believe that what we do every day matters in the lives of people? And if you do, the cultures can be very different, but it's, we get to go to that core. And we've been, I think, Mike, as you know, very successful in our acquisitions. Everyone that we've acquired has grown faster post the acquisition than before, has been more profitable, and has delivered more value to more students in a faster period of time. That's the reason they're willing to sell. They want that. And we have to deliver that for them. So we're going we're gonna to go over time, and I, so less than a minute left, and I, but I want to get your response to each of this. What do you admire about, get, each, of, each of you gets a chance, what do you admire about each other's companies, and besides your company, which ed tech company do you think will be first to get to $100 billion market value? I'll go, you go first, Dan. Uh, well, I, I've only met Baiji, but what I admire is that he's taken his personal passion into a mission for his entire country. And there's more people in that country than any other country in the world but one. And, um, and it's been very difficult for companies to succeed using technology um, at the level that he's trying to do it. And the fact that he's been able to do so much so quickly and attract the kind of capital that it takes to do it, I just think is marvelous. And it, it blows me away and I'm humbled by it. Luis, I met a few years ago. What, what I love about Luis, what I admire about his company is he just keeps learning. He just keeps getting better. He just keeps getting his, his ideas get bigger and his passion gets more global. And what he's trying to do is give people the opportunity to improve their lives through language. And I think, I think we don't understand how important that is. And, and I've just marveled at a young guy that I met growing into this powerhouse. Um, yeah. and, um, and I have no idea who's going to be to a hundred billion first, but it, if either of these punks try to get there before me, I'll come see it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We're, we're out of time, but quick, guys. Luis, you next. Well, I mean, so, I, you know, I, I'll start with, with Dan because I've known him for a while. I'm, I mean, I've followed Czech for, for years, and I think it's an amazing transformation, you know, going from just textbook rentals to, to your current business. So I, I think that's, that's amazing. I mean, I, I know you just raised a billion dollars, but we're, just give us a few months. We're going to buy you. <laughs> you know what? Put me out of my just, just, hold, okay. just hold on. I'll be okay uh, working for you as long as you don't make me move to Pittsburgh. <laughs> Baiju, you got the last word. 
I, I, I also I, admire Baiju, by the way, which is it's incredibly <laughs> admirable. Uh, everything he's done, I just I, met him. It's really only in the like, like I, I got a chance to meet them, like because like these virtual meetings have made it easy for us to meet, uh, and possibly that's the reason why you got all three of us together. But uh, uh, I, I've been observing how Czech has been scaling and going deep into the the same segment, clear focus, and uh, a model. All three of us follow a similar model that way. I've looked at both these models. For a long time, my son has been on the like most of the languages which he's learning is from Duolingo. So I, I like I, there was a time where I was like uh, like everybody talks about it, and today like they've also been able to scale very fast in the last couple of years. So uh, there's a lot to learn from each other, and globally how like today like we started with the single market. Now uh, we are looking at how to actually take it to new markets, and that's where I'm learning from uh, both of them. In fact. You guys were amazing and you know, off the charts. Um, I hope I hope our audience enjoyed as much as I did. But thank you so much for participating. Keep keep rolling. You guys are changing the world. Thanks, thank Mike. You. Thank you. You're the only guy that can bring this all Mike. together. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, guys. Thank you.